everybody. Welcome once again. I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas tonight here on Facebook Live and GotGas.com. And we're going to be sharing it with another uh, guest that's on the show tonight. So we'll be talking about that in just a little bit. Behind the controls, the ever inimitable <laughs> is Bruce Barker. I'm still learning how to spell inimitable. Wait, wait, where's yeah. all this hand clapping coming from? <laughs> we, that's our new sound effects. That's our new sound effects. Yeah, we learned how to speak, not spell. Yeah, that's right. And I learned how to spell on a speaking spell. Oh, my gosh. No wonder you've got some confusion. I still have spill check on my phone. And I got spill check spill online, check, yeah, yeah, just in case. Spill check, yeah, that's yeah. how it comes up. Anyway, <laughs> sitting in between us all in her blondness. She likes her heels high and her car's low. It's Anna Octane. Today I'm a sandwich because I'm in a between sandwich? two. I'm the meat oh and the boy. bread. And, You're the yeah. sandwich. And our in-studio <laughs> guest from KNX Radio, their sports anchor, Yay! Randy Cardoon. And I'm gluten-free. Yes. <laughs> you guys Yes, Marta, he is gluten-free. Yes. He's staying that way. We're not going to try and introduce anything no. into his diet today. No, 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 no. 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 And Stur- Stormy Bird is lo- lurking, Stormy is lurking in the behind shadows. Us. Yes. <laughs> the Birdman is back here. After his uh, unsuccessful trip to the races, he had some car problems. We may end up talking about that as we go along. But we've got lots of coverage tonight. And we're going to be covering the Four-Cylinder Club of America, FCCA. It was a competing organization to the SCCA, the Sports Car Club of America, and we'll have Bill Wilkman calling in a little bit later on that. But one of the things we're going to talk about, and this, you know, happens. Cars get stolen, and sometimes they get recovered, and sometimes it's decades before they're found again. Well, hot property. A stolen 1968 Shelby GT500 turned up after the owner passed away, and when the heir got the car, he went to register it and it came up on the hot sheets. Now, why did it come up on the hot sheets for 30 some odd years? No one knows. But the original owner was notified the car was found and he wanted his car back. Well, dueling lawsuits went back and forth and in the state of California, yes, that's where it was, we found out contrary to past cases that I've seen, the person who originally owned the car was paid off by the insurance company. Therefore, he no longer had rights to the car the courts have now found. Ouch. So the new heir has the car. The VIN number was not correct on some form of the uh, uh, the registration. Now, this story was in Hemmings Classic Car, so you can read all about it there. We're going to show you the pictures of the car. Beautiful, typical Shelby machine, but it had to go... It The, the original owner who lost the car was paid about $5,000 to settle when it was sold or stolen originally. In 1970. In 1970, the value now over 100000 about 150, And he doesn't get his car back because he got $5,000 from the insurance company when it was stolen. The heir gets to keep the car, and they're going through the registration processes right now. Ouch. Well, actually, the heir sold the car. The car went up for sale. It's now up for it went up for public auction. Well, now he figured. Now he realized how much it's really worth, and he wants the money, honey. Forget about the the fact that he he, he was willed this car. He just wants the money. So all he was interested in was the money of the car, the value of the car. But was he didn't only know. See, was a, it's a '68 G, Shelby GT, but they thought it was a '65. Right, and that's where the problem was. The registration came up as a '68, but. <laughs> It was registered as a 65, and that threw up flags when, uh, I guess, he was trying to sell it. Did Actually, a police officer car? pulled him no. over. Uh, uh, a, a police officer... A knowledgeable one? ...pulled him over and said... Well, actually, there was a police officer behind him who was interested in the car and ran the plates without probable cause. And the plates came up as a 65 when he knew it was a 68, so he pulled the car over, and they discovered that it was uh, previously a stolen vehicle. And the heir of the uh, estate who was driving it said, well, I just inherited it, and I don't know. And then the insurance company was defunct, and, and eventually the original owner said, I want my car back. Right. And the insurance company 
of the current owner said, well, you can't because you already paid off for it. And his argument was, but it was stolen. I have the right to get my car back. And the insurance company said, no, because we paid you. You gave up your rights when you settled and took the settlement. Now, we had a similar case here in the Los Angeles area about three, four years ago, where a young lady was given a 1965 or 66 Mustang as a graduation present. And her father went through and restored it. He went to get it went to he let the plates expire. Hmm. He went to re-register it. Now it shows up on the hot sheets. Now, one of the other things, too, is on the Ford Mustangs and a lot of Fords, there is a what they call a warranty identification plate on the door. It has the VIN number in it, but it specifically says for warranty use only. On the inner front fender panel, on the driver's side, is the actual VIN number. That's where there's a notch in the sheet metal right. often on, on the, the fender. Mustangs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what they did is when he went to re-register the car and get it up to date, they found it on the hot sheet. The original owner was awarded the car back. Oh, man. Even though the present owner had just restored the car completely and given it to his daughter as a graduation present. So we've got conflicting settlements here in huh. the state of California for the same type of situation. So keep uh, with us. We're going to follow these things. Uh, we're going to give you SEMA news and all sorts of things that we find like this. This particular one you can read about in HemmingsClassic.com. And Hem- Hemmings Classic Car, you can take a look at it, read the full story on this car, and check it out. Y- you know, it's something to be wary of. And I know in my case, I've had two cars stolen over the past. My son's 64 Malibu and my Datsun race car. We got the Datsun back. We never did find the Malibu. Hmm. And we got a feeling that Malibu is either cut up or it's registered someplace else now. But my son was paid off on it. So yeah. he will never get it back. And we had a limit of liability insurance on it. He got what the limit of those of the liability was, which at the time was $9,000. The book value for a 64 SS Chevelle at the time was $22,000. Hmm. So technically, we learned a lesson. Keep track of the value of your vehicle (laughs) and make sure you're insured for the proper value, not what you necessarily bought the vehicle for. Yeah, and I'll admit, I tend to go low sometimes with that value because it means that you're paying a a lower insurance insurance rate. But can you replace the car for that? In a future show, we're going to go over how to properly find the market value of your car. And I'll set that up for our next show. What you have in the price of parts is not the value of your car. If you try to sell it for what you paid in parts, it is not going to happen, folks, unless you paid nothing for your car to start with and you were real frugal on what you spent on parts. So we'll go over that, and I'll give you some clues and some websites and things to check to find out what the market value is. Now, this is something to look at when you go for an appraisal. You can get appraisals that are blue sky. (laughs) And, you know, they'll say, oh, it's a $150,000 car. (laughs) Wow, I got a Yugo. It's $150,000. Well, we'll find out about that. We'll go over that a little bit later on. That'll be our next show coming up in two weeks. But right now, Anna Octane and I, we're talking about that. Now, Anna, we've got some SEMA news, too, because there's some pending laws that may affect some of our uh, viewers. Yes, that's true. In New York, they are trying to pass that uh, a single plate on a historical motor vehicle is acceptable. Yeah. Now, you were telling me that Model T's only had a single plate. Yeah, they didn't have a bracket in the front for a, a license plate. Right. But in California, you must have two license plates. And now you do. When the days of the Model T, and I've got uh, an early license plate from that era, they only issued one. In the state of California, what California says is if we issue two plates, you have to run two plates. And many states are like that. In the case of New York, they issue two plates, but many cars do not have the wherewithal to mount the front plate. And that's this law is pending. It's going to address that situation because what are you going to do? Drill holes in a fender? <laughs> I know. Well, I uh, I once I, I kind of hesitate to say this, but I don't own the car anymore, so I guess it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, attention, DMV, close your ears. Um, I had a Fiat 124 Spider. You know, I'm just sorry. A, I, it was a fun little car. Yeah, I, I, when it yeah. ran. Yeah. yeah, when it ran. It was an automatic. Can you imagine? No, what, an automatic sports oh. car. But um, uh, yeah, they, I was stopped uh, one day by the Popo, and they said, you know, you got to have a front plate on this car, and uh, there was nowhere to bolt a front plate. I'd never had the front plate. I got this car used. And so I cast... I didn't want to change my old blue plates. 
I cast one out of fiberglass from the original plate <laughs> and then stuck it in some frame and you know just sort of wired it onto the front bumper. But nobody ever knew apparently it was a fiberglass front plate. And I know that's not legal, but it not never quite. happened. No, it never happened. No. You never owned the Fiat. That's, that's an right. urban myth. I'm an urban myth. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm th- I think I dated her once. <laughs> but that's another story altogether. Uh, and there was something else going on in Indiana. Yes, Indiana is requiring factory installed or equivalent mufflers in um, in what is it the Senate? It could be. Okay. Well, they want to re- they want to require factory mufflers. So that means no turbo mufflers, no glass packs, no tubular mufflers with crushed ends because they're trying to control noise emissions and what in California it's 86 decibels. Yep. But but? That doesn't necessarily mean that you were able to get that type of muffler when you were changing your muffler back then. Yeah, and it may of, not have been no. available. Well, that's true. So what? that now means you have to go buy a new muffler. You have to buy a new muffler and buy an equivalent to what the yeah. OEM was. Now, the catch twenty two to this, and we'll have to see how that pans out. In nineteen sixty two, the Corvettes had an optional of no muffler. Oh. No muffler? No muffler. Was and that so the side the, pipe version car? Or? No. The 62, they didn't have side pipes yet, but there was a, a, a no muffler option. Wow. So that was something you could specify. I believe it was 1962. The GT350 from Shelby was the same way when you got the GT350R. It did not have mufflers. Now, was that streetable? Mm, <laughs> kind of. Was it registerable? Yeah, because it had a VIN number. But the GT350R did not have mufflers. Huh. Exhaust ran out the back, just like the regular one. Uh, and then there were some cars that had uh, Chevrolet and the Corvettes. They had a glass pack muffler standard. Well, so I'd, there's going to be some, uh, perhaps some issues. Well, there's going to be some wiggle room. And one of the other things that was kind of confusing on this one, Lana, what else did they say about what a muffler does? A muffler is supposed to be in constant operation to prevent excessive or unusual noise or smoke. Mufflers smoke. don't prevent smoke. <laughs> That's exhaust. Unless you're blowing it up someone's... (laughs) But that's another story altogether. But no, mufflers do not have anything to do with smoke, and anyone who's watching this already knows that. But the state of Indiana, you would figure, with all the racing that goes on there, would know better. Yeah. But apparently, that is not the case. So, Indiana, right now you're safe because they've recessed their their, uh, Senate hearings, and it did not get passed. So until they come back from their recess, this matter will not be taken up again. We'll keep you informed based on what we get from the SEMA guys. Dodge that bullet. Oh. So we're going to be going into that. We'll be talking about the FCCA in just a little bit. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back to more gas in just a bit.
All right, we're back live here at Gas, the Great American Auto Scene, and we're going to be moving on with lots of things. We got Randy Cardoon here in studio with us, and we're getting ready to talk about the Four Cylinder Club of America in just a little bit. But right now, let's talk to Randy. Randy, hey. what's going on? Hey, I'm here talking about cars. The podcast. You can see us. I'm just getting the plug like right out there, right out of the way here. And we're talking about cars. You can see us on uh, YouTube and right here on Facebook Live. And for those of you who are watching this, you're possibly sharing it with us on Facebook Live. And also you can hear our podcast on uh, iTunes and SoundCloud. So, again, that's kind of neat. That's what we do. We interview all sorts of interesting people, celebrities, car personalities, a lot of people you know of. And uh, we've got them running. You could listen to them any time. So, again, one of the reasons... Bob right now, who, by the way, you're wondering why he's not asking me questions. Why? <laughs> because Bob's on the phone ordering pizza. No, I didn't he's want texting, to know. and he's texting. He's texting for Chinese food. <laughs> he needs yes. a ticket. <laughs> well, now what he's doing? What, what, what ends up happening is we've got some viewers that don't know what our call-in number is. Yeah. So they're calling me on my cell phone. Oh, <laughs> oh really? So, you're giving out your cell phone number? Well, it's only a select few thousand. Yeah. And um, do you, think you are Jimmy Butler. For <laughs> yeah, well, not yet. No, hey, Jaden, uh, whatever his name is, is trying to call Jayden me right Jayden K. Now. Smith. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Don't answer that call, by no. the way. I hear it's going to just sabotage you. It friend. might be. Nasty Knoll from beautiful downtown Agora. Is that where he's from? Newbury no, Park, Newbury Park. Think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is calling in right now. Yeah. Or, or sending me nasty grams. Or just, just giving you an update on the latest car he bought. And he's showing me a four-door Malibu. That's a travesty. Well, wait a minute. What year? New. Oh, oh! <laughs> I mean, it's not, I don't, not, not even an old one. Nobody here knows what to say about I mean, that, Bob. I don't know. Oh, that's an older why, one. Say, that's like why? porn. No, yeah. No, let's not get carried away. Okay, well, now now he's showing <laughs> me like a the most mu- boring in the- yeah a, must- a 2004 <laughs> Mustang convertible. Okay. Okay, that's getting closer. Yeah. Yeah, the guy knows he's selling a 2004, <laughs> but uh, never mind. <laughs> We don't want to talk about that car. What did he no. carjack no, a, a Malibu? Is that what you're saying? It okay. must be, yeah. I mean, police don't even use that car. I mean, for, I know. It's there's that a good boring. reason it's for a, it. Yeah, yes. come on. That car is, in fact, transparent to all police detection equipment. <laughs> well, then maybe that's why he's trying to get rid of it. Well, that could be. <sighs> oh, the life we have to lead what, as where, being where stars. Where are we? I completely forgot. Well, I yeah. don't we know. Were, we were going to discuss what the most scandalous thing you discussed on your radio program was. I don't remember that, but that could be something. We, let's see. Let me think about that. What was cut out? Scandalous. Let's put it this way. Scandalous. Okay. Cut out. Oh, nothing's cut out. A lot of ums and ahs, but that's about uh, it. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, we have some really fun guests, and when it comes to talking about things like, um, gosh, uh, there's all sorts of interesting people that we've talked to. Um, the folks from Storage Wars. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've talked to uh, the auctioneers. Mm-hmm. And had a chance, and, and they have some interesting back and forth because they're married, and yes. we found out how they met, and they oh. met at an auction. Really? And uh, also... Who got the high bid? Never obviously, mind. he did. <laughs> did? Yeah. Yeah, so that was... Yeah, you notice how I just went in right... right now, in is that, that show scripted nice or semi-scripted, or is that truly... Well, it depends on who you talk to. The guy that's con- that's complaining and got o- got kicked off the show once says it was scripted. That's Is that true. He and didn't they, get the winning but they bid. brought him back. They brought him back. So <laughs> they, they did they, bring him back. They came to an agreement. They paid him <laughs> off, probably. Right. And by the way, one of them, just to prove that this can happen, because a lot of you out there who are car couples, you know, one likes Chevy, one likes Ford, and yeah. you go, well, how can that work? Well, it does because that couple was basically one like Chevys and one like Fords. And they are happy as a clam today. All right, now, if someone wants to listen to your show talking about cars, mm-hmm. what what can they do? Well, they simply uh, go over to uh, iTunes. Go over to iTunes, and also we have all our episodes there. We're up to about 92 episodes now. Wow. Yeah, we've been doing it since 2014. Holy. Uh, also on SoundCloud. There, we're on SoundCloud. Uh, and also, for those of you here in the Los Angeles area, on Sundays we do a two-minute teaser show on KNX 1070 News Radio where we play some of the interviews from some of the folks uh, that we've interviewed over the past. I was one. Yes, you were one because uh, we did a little segment on Bob and his lovely wife Peggy getting yeah. married. Yes, we did. That was kind of cool when they had the big wedding out at uh, Irwindale Speedway. That nice. was kind of fun. So uh, we did that. In fact, on the most recent one that you yes. had, we actually interviewed 
I say we as in the royal we, mm-hmm. uh, I interviewed <laughs> yes. uh, the couple that got married at the last one, which was yeah. kind of neat. And they kind of had an interesting story as well. Yeah, now, I fun. would just rattle that off to you, but then what's the point of listening to the show? Oh, yeah, no, you got you to listen to the show. Yeah. And it's uh, talking about cars, they can find you on Facebook. Facebook, uh, iTunes, uh, we've done video ones also, um, not all of them, but some of them are on uh, right here on Facebook Live. You can go to our Talking About Cars page. Also, as you'll scroll down a little bit, also on YouTube. You know, one of the most interesting ones that were really popular on YouTube, we interviewed uh, Paul Michael Glazer oh. and Antonio Fargas from the original Starsky, Starsky. and Huggy Bear. Yeah. And we interviewed him in a Ford Torino. Oh, wow. And that was fun because yeah. they had a chance to talk about some of the cars and, and some of the things. You know, Michael uh, Paul Michael Glazer was hysterical because he's sitting there and talking about how much they hated that car. Really? They hated it. They hated the car. Initially, I guess it was supposed to be a Camaro or something, and okay. Ford was one of the sponsors, so they brought that in. And they really tried to destroy that car, so they'd sit there and just <laughs> slide it and smash it. And, and one of the interesting things was, initially when it came out, uh, it had, it had bench seats. Yeah. So the problem with that is every time Paul would spin the wheel, David would end up in his lap. David Soul, right? Oh, uh, so that was they, acceptable in those days. Yeah. So they had to uh, change it to bucket somewhere down the line, and I guess that helped. Uh, we also had Richard Carpenter. Oh. Wow. Now Richard Carpenter, for those you know him from the Carpenters Music Group, and he and his wife. Uh, excuse me, he and his sister. Sis? Mm-hmm. Hello. And so he also in. A Thousand Oaks Newbury Park area, he has a little warehouse that he has a whole collection of cars. Mm. And Richard is a big Chrysler guy. Yeah. Big Chrysler guy. He's got some other ones too. He's got some uh, Lincoln Mark II. He's got some other cars as well. But he is a big Chrysler guy and he collects cars that most of you would not think to collect from Chrysler. You mm. think of, okay, he's got a Roadrunner. Eh, not really. No. He doesn't have a Duster. He, he has a 1960 Dodge Polara. A 1958 Dodge. These are cars that are just not collected. They are completely primoed out. And uh, if you, he has a website uh, yesterday once more, I believe. Mm. And if oh, you go to oh, that, perfect. that'll show some of the pictures of the cars. And also on uh, our Talking About Cars page, you can check that out as well. We've shown some of those pictures. So there's a lot of wild cars that he's got. And he had a big following on YouTube. Yeah, so. now, I remember uh, before he moved out to that area, he was down in Downey, mm-hmm. and they had just done the movie about the Carpenters. All the cars in the movie were his, and mm. some of them were either the family's cars or cars that duplicated what his family had at that mm-hmm. time. Huh. Which is kind of neat. Yeah, and if you ever have his albums, and I'm sure yeah. a lot of you do, uh, if you look for the ones that actually have cars on it, Two in particular really stand out, and they're both his, and he still has them. Yeah. Uh, you know, and one of them being a 1965 Plymouth, um, I believe it was a Belvedere or a Satellite convertible, okay. yeah, blue, and it was really bought by his parents when they moved out here and got a new car, and uh, he ended up getting it later. So it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you could listen to it again on uh, iTunes, uh, Richard Carpenter, and, and all the interesting people. Just look at the list that we have, and it's kind of fun because the one thing I enjoy doing about this yeah. is you get a chance. I mean, we all know celebrities. We've seen them in movies. We've seen them as they want to be portrayed. But if you ask them about their cars, their interest in cars, mm-hmm. they just go off. It's just a great opportunity to listen to people, and they talk for a long time. I, I always tell the story about Barry McGuire. Yeah. Barry McGuire, as you know, uh, McGuire's Car Care Products. Uh, when I first interviewed him at SEMA back in 2015, he came to me and he was doing his own show for SEMA. And I said, gee, do you have like a, maybe 15, 20 minutes? He says, well, how much exactly? I said, okay, 20 minutes is fine. He said, okay, sit down. I'm doing my own show too, but let's get this in. He talks. He was eloquent. He had great stories. At about 38 minutes, <laughs> I said to him, uh, Barry, we're kind of getting up. Shouldn't we like wrap it up? And he goes, oh. Yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> and he could have gone another hour and a half. And uh, and yeah. that's kind of the way a lot of car people are. Yeah. You know, and speaking we, of celebrities, I'll yes. just poke this in just because we're all name dropping. Well, you're yeah. name dropping. Well, no, I'm going to drop. I'm going to drop. Wait, I want to drop. 
Go ahead. Uh, you know, about a mile and a half down the street here and a couple of yeah. blocks over is the the big iHeart radio facility. You know, Randy, it's over there on Olive. I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah you've heard of those, <clears throat> those traitorous dogs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. But uh, yeah, nice. I know that uh, at 6 o'clock, right when this show started, Pacific Time, was um, uh, Jay Leno is filling in for one of the uh, radio really? shifts over there at one of the radio really? stations. So, uh, yeah, right down the street, there's Jay, and he's doing a show. It kind of sounds like what's happening right here. What, what time does he show off? Because we can, we can drive Seriously, over there by right the time now? he walks yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Right now. and uh, Well, don't listen. Wait till after we're on. and then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right. He'll yeah. be on for another two hours after two we're hours. off. See, okay. they, they make him work. We, you oh, know, so we got it easy because we're big celebrities here. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, Randy, we're going to be back to you just a little bit. But right now we're going to be talking about the Four Cylinder Club of America. And Bill Wilkman is on the phone with us right now. He is the head historian, I guess you could say. He's the only historian. For the Four Cylinder Club of America, he's keeping it alive. It's got its own uh, Facebook page and more, I believe. And, uh, Bill, are you do- how are you doing out there? I'm doing just great. I actually don't have a Facebook page, but I oh. do have a website. Well, that's what it was. And, I knew it was uh, something electronic. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm I'm a little bit old in terms of uh, computer technology. So as far as I've come as website, I have not created a Facebook page, but that's a good idea. I should probably do that. Yeah, I'll help you on that if you want. Just let me know. And uh, because Bill and I have a connection with the Four Cylinder Club. I was the past president of the club oh. many decades ago, and I think I, I just got reelected, didn't I? <laughs> to some post. I Something, yeah. We're we're keeping it alive. It, uh, it 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 was a very instrumental club in the beginning of the sports car craze in the United States, wasn't it? Bill? Yeah, it was actually it was actually uh, it started around 1950, and um, before very long, they had uh, chapters in ten different states in the United States. Um, when I was counting them up, they had about 50 chapters. I know they had a lot more than that because I've discovered more since then. But uh, they were a pretty big thing in the uh, in the early 50s or through the 50s and into the 60s. Uh, it was quite a uh, an active and quite a um, a significant club. All right. Now, the, the, some of the guys are still around. I, I run into them occasionally, not intentionally, you know, not hard, but at uh, some of the uh, the local events here in Southern California. But these guys were the, uh, I guess, the odd men out. They had import cars. They had Austins. They had MGs. They had Singers. They had all the cars that us car nuts kind of read about but may not have necessarily seen. And these guys were driving the heck out of them. They yeah, were, they were um, they were unique in that way. I think that's part of what made the club such a vibrant entity. Is that um, the members of the club were the type of people that didn't do what everybody else did. They all looked for the unusual. They looked for the uh, unique. Uh, they looked for opportunities to sort of be outside the realm of uh, the average person's activities. And uh, so. They were, back in the day, when everybody else was driving Fords and Chevys and Plymouths with six- and eight-cylinder engines, they were driving four-cylinder cars, primarily British, MGs and Austins and Hillmans and and uh, Singers and vehicles of that sort. And uh, even back in the day when these cars were more common, uh, they were still considered to be um, uh, out of the ordinary, and people that drove them were considered to be somewhat a little bit strange. Well, yeah, I can attest to that. I met a few of them from the original club back in the day. But, yeah, they had, they had some great cars. Now, these are cars that today you'll find in museums or only coming out on weekend shows. And they drove these things. Every, it was a daily driver. Some of them had barely usable heaters. Uh, here's a, a group. There's a, I don't know if you're watching us, Bill, right now, but there's two Austins. There's an MG, and I can't tell. It looks like another Austin besides that. Mm-hmm. Now, these cars were readily available in Great Britain, but very rare here in the U.S. because they were small and underpowered. Right. And right after World War II, uh, there was a market for British sedans because um, American cars had not come up to uh, a, a level of production where they could meet the demand for cars. And so people would buy anything with four wheels. Uh, and the way I got involved in this thing, my dad was looking for a car in the late 1940s, and um, he couldn't find a new car. He could not find one to buy. So a friend of them said, "Well, a friend of his said, well, why don't you take a look at an Austin?" And he said, "What's an Austin?" 
And my dad's friend said, an Austin's like a British Chevrolet. <laughs> so he went down to Light Car Motors in, uh, in Hollywood. Uh, Light Car Motors was one of the very early car dealerships that handled uh, foreign cars. And he bought an Austin A40 and ultimately ended up joining the Four Cylinder Club of America. And I remember as a five-year-old uh, bouncing around in the back seat of his Austin A40 Devon as he uh, ran different kinds of rallies and car events with the Four Cylinder Club of America. Uh, one of the things that uh, kept me interested in was a patch that my dad bought uh, from the club. It was a felt patch for the Four Cylinder Club of America. And I just always had it hanging around and always uh, would run across it when I would go through my drawers of, of uh, various items. And uh, eventually I decided, hey, I'm going to go ahead and start researching the history of the club. And that's when I created the website. And we met probably, I don't know, 10 or so years ago when you started uh, bringing things back together again on the club. I mean, right. The, the club kind of I existed. Started the website, but... I started the website in 2010. And uh, all of a sudden, because there was an Internet presence, I began to hear from lots of people who had been associated with the club. And you were one of the people that uh, said, hey, I was doing a little uh, Internet search and I came across this. And I was a uh, president of the club. And actually, you provided me with some of the really key archival materials that document the history of the club uh, in its very early days and um, through... Uh, a point at which the club began to uh, to go into decline. Yeah, we tried to resurrect the club when I was uh, real involved in it. We made it, it. It was a rally in a social group. We kept the social aspect of it because we were just uh, you know a good group of people that had sports cars and raced. But we were doing more autocrossing. The only thing that we kind of kept going at the time, the forerunner of what was called the mobile economy run was kind of the four-cylinder clubs event that went from Los Angeles to Vegas. And right. We, we still they did that. They started out calling it an economy run, and I guess because of the conflict with a mobile's name, they ended up calling it a frugality run. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but they were doing it, and uh, they, they used a, a, a strange formula. It was ton mileage, or mileage per ton. Right. It wasn't miles uh -huh. per gallon, but it was based on the weight of the vehicle. And I can remember we went up to, uh, we left the, uh, I think it was North Hollywood, and drove up to Las Vegas. We all converged at a hotel there. All, it was probably about 30 or 40 cars that went up and to see who got the best mileage going up. Right. I, I had an interesting conversation with a member whose name will remain anonymous who told me that he showed up with his car and he put in his trunk a bunch of concrete blocks. <laughs> so when they measured the weight of the vehicle, they ended up getting a seriously higher level of uh, uh, weight than the car actually uh, was. So then he went back to his home, took the concrete blocks out, and ended up uh, winning the event. And I, I thought, well, you know, why would you do that to win a simple amateur trophy? But anyway, it was one of those hijinks that uh, club member uh, decided to engage in to, to win a little uh, uh cast aluminum uh, trophy. <laughs> yeah, but they were a, a, a really eclectic group of people, too, and they were the guys that were the, I guess, the pioneers of sports cars at that point in time. And they were, contrary right, to were. SCCA, the racers, they were doing more of the social and the rallies. Right. They, they did dabble in racing a little bit. Uh, there was an event that was held in the 50s called the Motorsports Week. And one of the events they held was a race at uh, Chino Airport. Mm -hmm. uh, that turned out to be quite a disaster because the uh, the racetrack was uh, not suitable for the purpose. And uh, a, um, a publication called Honk Magazine at the time yeah. did an article, and they called it the uh, the Wild Hay Ride or something like that because mm. the cars kept running into the hay bales and mm. spreading hay all over the place. Oh, gee. Yeah, well, the Hunk, I think, became either Carcraft or, or Hot Rod magazine back in the day. I believe Carcraft. I believe yeah. it became Carcraft. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But, yeah, they wouldn't have understood it anyway because they were into Detroit iron back then. They didn't understand yeah. that stuff. And individual members did race their cars. They didn't race them uh, in FAC events, but there were members who were active racers. Yeah. And uh, including one person that I documented, a guy named Dave Albee who entered his Austin A40 Devon, a little four-door yeah. British sedan, in the first Pebble Beach race. 
and um, he uh, he showed up. And uh, in those days, there weren't any requirements for entering a race. You just paid your fee. Right. And they inspected his car, and the guy that inspected the car said, your tires are too worn. You can't enter this car with those tires. So he went to one of his friends, and his friend uh, went to his wife, and his wife had an eyebrow pencil. <laughs> she, and they took the eyebrow pencil, and they, they actually traced the grooves of the tire to make them appear to be deeper than they were. <laughs> and they went back to the inspector, and they said, here, we've got uh, more, uh, we've got tires with more treads on them. And the inspector <laughs> said, great, you're now an entry in the race. Yeah, we were so just showing. We, yeah, that that happens a lot. I've seen that happen. We were just showing a picture, <laughs> and this is of Lou Zaninovich, who was a, a, a very prolific member of the four cylinder club in the seventies. And he has a TVR. Now, this wasn't uh-huh. a four cylinder at that point in time. We didn't limit it to four cylinder cars. This was a, a Triumph six cylinder powered, hand built fiberglass sports car. Uh huh. And this was taken at Antelope Valley College in Lancaster, where we would block off the parking lot and get about a half-mile course uh, and have some fun. You can see that at this point, you can see a lot of the tire, the rubber left on the uh, the course, so to speak. But it, right. it, it we, we became, we merged with a club called the College Corvette Club in Studio City. And mm-hmm. one of the reasons we did FCCA, they were already incorporated and we were able to get insurance. Now we talked. To, now you and I had a friend, Randy York, who passed away sh- a short time ago. Here's a picture of his 510 at that same event. So I didn't realize you had some of those uh, events, some of these old pictures. We might even find one of me going around a corner. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. That would be cool. This was the logo we had for the uh, what was called Motorsports Enthusiast Car Club out of Lancaster, and the FCCA logo or letters on the pylon because we were primarily an autocross and uh, road race club. Yeah, I think you were a bunch chapters. of hot rodders and foreign cars. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. That's what you were. Yeah, you know, to, to the letter of the word hot rod, modifying the cars, yeah, they were. Uh, but they limited it to, at the time, imports. There were very few American cars, if any, in the club because there were no four-cylinder right. American cars at the time. It started out that uh, to be a member of the club, you had to have a four-cylinder car. And uh, then they started allowing uh, larger uh, uh, engines, uh, six- and eight-cylinders, but you were only allowed to be an associate member with that type of car. And I think things loosened up from there. But originally, it was strictly for four four-cylinder powered cars. Uh, again, because they wanted to provide a place for people who were you know, pioneers mm-hmm. and uh, people that were seeking a different kind of uh, lifestyle to have a place where they could jo- enjoy their interest with other like-minded people. So this is the, the start of the sports car craze, and this, uh, as we said, the, the, car, the club started here in Glendale, California, and spread pretty much across the country, uh, and it's somewhat is still alive today. We don't do much of anything, but it is a, a club with a lot of historic value and you've got the website you can read about things you've got a lot of photographs uh, posted on that website of days gone by and you've got a lot of memorabilia for that club that we, we've located and found and uh, got to you so that you can uh, keep it uh, preserved yeah it's, it's www.fourcylinderclubhistory.com with four being spelled out and uh, there's an extensive amount of information out there. You can spend, if you wanted to, you could spend an hour or two uh, going through all the different layers of history and photographs and things of that nature. All right. Well, Bill, thank you very much for calling in. We appreciate okay. it. And hopefully we get some more interest in this. And who knows, maybe the Four Cylinder Club can grow and thrive again. It would be nice. All right. Thanks again for calling in, Bill. Four Cylinder Club. Okay, thank you. Take care. Have a great evening. Thank you. All right, well, none of us here have four-cylinder cars. I do. You do? I have a Nissan oh, Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, you know, that's right. It's a You're, four-cylinder. I forgot. I wasn't thinking of, of <laughs> You know, new the cars. body lines on those foreign sports cars back then were yeah. beautiful. They looked like little Delahays, didn't they, some well, of them? Was, and a beautiful. lot of the, the inspiration for a lot of those cars came from that. There was the Jawa Jupiter, which I think was one of the photos they just showed. Mm-hmm. The Singer, which everyone thinks of sewing machines, had nothing to do with that. MG. Uh, 
even Jaguars looked like the MG. I think the MG was probably patterned off the the Jag, uh, the early Jag roadsters, which didn't have the swoopy big uh, bulbous fenders of the time. And well, would they also have cars that were like the Vauxhalls yeah. of the era and, oh, and yeah. a lot of the different cars? Because I remember we had neighbors when I grew up in Los Angeles that they had a Vauxhall, and I thought, yep. how cool is that? Somebody shrunk a '56 Ford, yeah, or, or something, <laughs> along, or something those along those lines. lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, the, and the original Capri was British, not not German, right. and looked like a shrunk 1960 Ford. So, you know, you, you Ford's gone through a lot of, they had a lot of Ford cylinder cars. I remember uh, in, in Europe, fuel prices were a lot higher than ours. The streets were a lot narrower. Yeah. American cars were a rarity there, and big cars were a rarity, unless you had the money to buy a Rolls Royce or a big Jag sedan or something of that nature. But even then, you couldn't go on most packed streets between houses because they were very narrow. So cars became narrow. Uh, Fiat was a prime example of that. They never had a big car. Yeah, because the old towns were not built for cars. The towns were built for horse and buggy, and people walking. I was thinking how cool it—you know, half a second. I was thinking how cool it would be to have a, a Trabant in the four-cylinder yeah. club. But that's—isn't that a two-cylinder car? I think so. Yeah, so and I, it's hard well, to call you that get a car. two of them. Yeah, you could. Put yeah. two engines in one. Yeah, just tie it together. Right? Yeah. You want to hear a secret about Trabant? Uh-oh. Sure. Some of the guys would uh-huh. take modified motorcycle motors yeah. and pull the two cylinder, two, the the motor, the stock Trabant motor out, put yeah. the modified motorcycle motor in, and then race Ferraris on the autobahn and <laughs> beat them. <laughs> oh, that's gonna really because they're upset a very them, lightweight car. Yeah. They only weigh about a thousand pounds. Yeah. And so they're actually a sleeper. You could turn them into a cool little yeah, race car. Once the wall came down, then Eastern uh, Germany didn't have the lock on the Trabant, and people in West Germany and the rest of Europe could get that car, which really wasn't that reliable to start with. Yeah. But, in uh, fact, I suspect a lot of them were just instantly thrown away. Yeah, probably were they, if they didn't rust before your very eyes. And would well, you want to actually drive a car like that <laughs> that rusts before your very eyes? Well, they eyes didn't rust. That's speed? the other thing. Yeah. They didn't rust. Some of them were made out of plastic. a plastic resin with cotton and wool fiber in them yeah. that would keep them from rusting. But they had steel over the uh, stress stress points yeah. on the vehicle. But, you know, it was a East Block car. They couldn't get VW Beetles over the wall. And no. and <laughs> and so, you know, they they would be left by the roadside and, and the kids would just <laughs> they would just make hot rods out of them, basically. Yeah. They weren't worth much, so let's just leave it here. I'm not going to yeah. tow it back. It costs more to tow than to, to buy. And you remember the Yugo. I oh, yeah. sure. Back in my Chevy Vega camback wagon <laughs> days, uh, I remember the Yugo. Mm-hmm. And the Yugo, if you ever looked at the front bumper thinking, oh, wow, you're going to have a really nice big bumper here. Yeah, it's big. It's got Whoa. less plastic than my model cars when I was growing up. Yeah. So heaven forbid you ever bumped somebody or rear-ended somebody. Well, the strange thing about the Yugo was a Fiat. And it was built in Yugoslavia. Now, Fiats are not known for the reliability, but Yugo took it to a higher level. And that became an extremely unreliable car. Yeah, I had a girlfriend that had a Yugo, and I worked on it um, for a short while. And you're right, it was very much Fiat, but uh, they had stripped down some more of the stuff. The starter, for instance, on the Fiat version of that same car, I don't know what the model was for a Fiat. Uno. 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 Yeah, it was the Uno. Okay. What? Or the Panda. I thought they had a another, bunch of little small cars like that. Bob Beck dead no, pen no, joke. No, 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 no. But the uh, the starter on the on the Fiat version was a it was a four brush you know a motor armature. Um, the Yugo only had two brushes, and so it, it was more prone to failure because if you get any of that stuff yeah. dirty as it's spinning around, then there's no electrical contact. They so, save twenty cents per vehicle. I know. I, yeah. Hey, speaking of weird things in vehicles. Yes. Uh- can I call my chiropractor That's in now? my I car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's in your car. Yeah, go ahead. So I buy this car, and okay. I because I blew the motor on the Honda okay. uh, across the street from the Hollywood Bowl. I lead-footed it, and boom. Oh. oh. You know how I am. I yes, I do. So I get yeah. this new car, What'd and I got a 2002 Nissan Ultima oh, from Kansas. An ultimatum. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I sit in the car and I look and I go, there's a cat folder in my car. <laughs> Why is there a cat folder in my car? Well, you got to fold them sometimes, I guess. <laughs> so I don't I'm know. sorry, did you just say a cat? There's a cat folder. Cat in, folder. Yes. So I was wondering if you push the button, do cats pop out like little, you know? 
folded and starched, <laughs> ready to go. And so somebody on Facebook, Instagram, or Insta- Facebook's me and says, that means catalog folder, oh. Anna. Which is catalog. still kind of weird. Still kind of weird to yeah. put on your what uh, kind instrument of ca- panel. Yeah, for your catalog? stereo. Oh, I like think it's s- for the stereo. So in case Cataloging. you save music? Yeah, something. Okay. Well, then you're going to scan your mutes. Well, let me tell you, I'm a 66 Ford girl. Yes. And I don't know about cat folders. I know about Edelbrock four-barrel carburetors, but not cat folders. I would just go directly for the info setup and get it and start from scratch. That's what I would do. But that's just me. But you know what I want to say? I am dating a Chevy guy. Yes, you are. And so it does work, the Ford and Chevy thing. That's because Ford is first on race day and we win automatically. Well, you know, you got to go back even further than that. In the early 1900s, Lewis Chevrolet and his brother were famous not for their Chevrolet cars, but for the cylinder heads and race motors they built for Model Ts and Model As. You had lunch with them, didn't you? Probably, yeah, a couple of times. They taught me everything I know. Yeah, Yeah, and the only thing a lot of people think (laughs) 1955 was the first Chevrolet V8. No, 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 no. Check it out, folks. 1917. And I believe it was even 283 cubic inches. I think it was 1913 was the first V8. It was a from race. Chevrolet? Well, not from Chevrolet, no, but, but from the Chevrolet. first V8. Chevrolet's fir- when they first came out with their car in 1917, they had a V8 engine. That, that is odd first that V8. it would be a 283, if that's true. Yeah, I think it was either 265 or 283, but it was the same dimensionally as the later model small blocks that came out after 1955. And, of course, it would have generated just a tiny fraction of the horsepower of the... Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, it was maybe 60 horsepower. Yeah. And that's because it was a race motor. But um, back in those huh. days. But, yeah, check it out. If you, if you research Lewis Chevrolet... They made cylinder heads and racing motors for Model A's and Model T's, which were popular at the time. Huh. Well, you know what? You I, know what? <clears throat> I I turned him to the dark side. He got a Ford Falcon, even though it's a gasser. He got a yeah. Ford. Dun, dun, I win. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> is the car a gasser or is Stormy? Um, well, this is the gas show, so yeah, yeah maybe gasser. Maybe both, huh? Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're talking about the cars we've kind of messed up over years and had randy what kind of cars do you have what kind of cars do i have now yeah that i messed up or no just, you didn't oh, that i have no, yours now. aren't messed up but what do you have now well they've been messed up but yeah, yeah um well let's see right now i have a 64 dodge polaro mostly, mostly because two-door hardtop 440 in it and mostly because I had a version of that in high school. Ah, okay. You know, we all wonder, well, why do you have cars? And a lot of people think they either want really badly the car they had in high school because it was so cool, or it was memorable, or they just want no part of the car they had in high school, (laughs) which, you know, which can be. Mine wasn't necessarily, it was memorable, but not for the reasons you think. And not that reason either. No. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I was going down. We once, and I, and I think when I was on here last time, we, we chatted about this a little bit, but it was a four-door, kind of like LAPD at the time used 1964 Plymouth Belvedere's mm-hmm. right. as their car. So they were structurally as good as you can get it when they had the police package in it. Uh, the 64 Dodge Polaro my mother drove yeah. that I eventually got uh, wasn't quite as structurally there, but... <laughs> We once uh, decided to put it into a high school car show. So when we were going to put it into a high school car show, I decided to put it into the funny car category. Ah. But not having a lot of money as a kid and driving around on nylon tires. Yeah. You remember those. Yeah. I decided I would kind of kind of riff on the meaning of the word funny car. Yeah. So we put big eyes in the headlights, put polka dots all over it, and a big clown hat on top. <laughs> I have a picture of that somewhere, but I'll, I'll show yeah. it to you one day. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> that was what we ended up doing there. So uh, this is currently the third Polara that I have been able to get, and that's mm-hmm. kind of fun. It's very enjoyable. And I also got a 1957 Pontiac Custom Safari Wagon. Oh, uh, sweet. Which yes. is the Pontiac version of the Nomad. Mm-hmm. Which is, yeah. And they didn't make many of them, so no. just to find it, it took me, th- once I decided to find to get one, it yeah. took me three years to try and find one because wow. usually they were not available or really destroyed or really rusted out. But luckily, I found one up in Gilroy, California, and I've uh, been working on it ever since. So it's that's kind of fun. Oh, man. Station mm-hmm. wagons, too, are just so cool anyway. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, absolutely. I, and we all have stories about station wagons. Now, Anna, what did you have in high school? 
I still have that car, that 66 Ford Mustang. We're the right. original owner. Oh, okay. I've been driving it since I was 14. We call it the 300,000-mile Mustang. 14. So, yeah, I've been driving it a year. Yeah. Yay! Nice. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh. She's Yay. been hanging around wow. us a lot now. She does and, math um, like we do. And then I bought a 55 Studebaker and yeah. then a 47 truck, and I just kept going backwards. Yes, you have. And then I sold the truck to a Vietnam veteran. And oh, his, you did sell the truck? Yeah. Okay. Him and his grandson are going to build it, and Mitch Hines is still working on the Studebaker, and then I went through a series of Hondas and mm-hmm. Nissans. And yes, it happens. And you're kind of like a drag racer. You're quite capable of disassembling your vehicle while in motion. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, I've parked the Mustang because there's too many weirdos in LA uh, feeling up my car when yeah, I'm at Ralph's me? and I don't like that. Mm. I don't want them touching my car when touching. I'm shopping. And, okay. And so it's hiding now. It's, it's in hiding. hiding. All right. But um, I'm going to thrash Stormy's Falcon soon. Are you? <laughs> this is going to be interesting. <laughs> Hold on. I'm looking up the definition of thrash. Hold on. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. Okay. As soon as he lets me drive it, he won't let me drive it right now. Though. Well, you know, he can take the four barrel and knock it so that it stays only on one barrel, and then maybe you could drive it then. And I'm sure after this show, it will be a lot longer, longer, longer than you anticipated. Yes. All right, Bruce, you have your high school car parked out in front here. That's true, and, and Anna, yours is a 66. Mine was a 67. Uh, I bought it when I was 15, and I still have it. I bought it from my math teacher, Bruce Hummel, and uh, it was a baby blue car, and, and it was already eight years old then, and it was already, because of where I lived, it was just already rusty. Yeah. So I learned right away the wonders and dangers of Bondo. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, um, yeah. But do you have so, a very rare Alaskan hot rod? Right? I guess in a way, it's sure. It's an Alaskan yeah. hot rod. It's in a, yeah, a rare in the sense, I guess, that where I lived, few people would ever dare take their cars out of that town once they got the cars in because you have to fly them in and out, so it's really expensive. But it's also, you know, once you get them there, it's all dirt roads, and so it just destroys cars um, yeah. pretty quickly. So, um, but yeah, it was like my car. I got to have it. So. Yeah. Well, I, and me, my, my first high school car was a 1949 Dodge Coronet. How about it? And I thought I taught myself how to drive a stick. You thought? I thought. It had what was called gyromatic drive. It was a torque converter with a clutch pedal and a three-speed transmission. You couldn't stall it. Because oh. once you only used the clutch pedal so you could put it in gear. <laughs> once it was in gear, it was an automatic transmission, basically, <laughs> other than you had to push the clutch to shift. But you couldn't stall it because the clutch facing went up against the torque converter. So you thought you knew how to drive a stick. Because I didn't stall it. I thought I knew how to drive a stick. I didn't realize what gyromatic drive was. And then uh, I, I blew the engine on that, disassembling it in motion, before I was even 16. Mm. So I was working at a gas station, and I bought an Anglia station hey, wagon. Those are cool. Those it was a, are a 1957 cool. Anglia station wagon. They called it an Escort. Hmm. So I had the only Escort in high school. Um Hmm. Were you in escort service in high school? No, <laughs> but I used to go to McDonald's and get burgers for everybody. Uh, and then yeah. I, I, I don't remember what happened with that, but I ended up with a Simca, what? a wow. French Chrysler. You just went, uh, you went for strange cars just right away. I, of course. And then my next car, I crashed that one. I found out that Buick's back bumpers are much stronger than French cars. Hmm. But you know what? Anything different in high school was cool. We didn't want to well, yeah. be the same as everybody else. Oh, and I definitely proved that. Yeah. You want to know where I learned how to burn rubber? Sure. I learned how to burn rubber in a 69 Z28 Camaro on uh-huh. the nitrous bottle on Laurel Canyon nitrous. Boulevard. Oh, oh Canyon. you were the Ooh. one. Yeah. Okay. That was yeah. me. Yeah. Okay, now and we used to race a lowered 72 Corvette with a Doug Nash 5-speed against Bobby Carradine on Mulholland. Wow. <laughs> for, what was he for money. Um, a vet. He had a vet. Mm-hmm. And we beat him. <laughs> you beat him? <laughs> yeah. yeah we, you know, street machines. We were called the street machines. Well, you know, when everyone talks about street racing, and I don't know, you, you, we're all car people, so we got involved in street racing. In Los Angeles, we had more than just straight line street racing. Mulholland Drive, which is a very curvy, mountainous road that goes across the San Fernando Valley, separates L.A. from the San Fernando Valley. We used to have road racing at night. With, so with no and headlights and no night, no lights. No, and we had one guy that had a delay switch on his brake pedal, so that when he hit the brakes, the light wouldn't come on immediately, 
and the guy that was chasing him would think he was going into a corner deeper, and he could do that too. Ouch. So he'd wait, he'd go in too deep, then hit his brakes, and they'd spin out. Oh man! And I had one friend who drove a tow truck, and he'd wait at the other end of the where the race was because he knew someone was going over the side eventually. <sighs> and he'd make it that time. This was nineteen. 19- yeah, in the 60s. Oh, okay. And um, he would get 100 bucks to tow a car up, which was big money at the time because he was only getting like seven or eight bucks for a regular tow. So he was Man. getting 100 bucks to tow a car up out off the side of Mulholland Drive. And then we had one turn, we called it Grandstand. And it was a hill that you could sit on and watch all the racing go by. It was one long sweeping turn. Wow. So we could watch it. And a lot of us learned how to. Uh, Road race <laughs> up there, sometimes the hard way, but uh, um, so we, we had our opportunities. We had drag racing and the road racing. Of course, now it's racing. heavily populated. You, you wouldn't. Well, want now it. they've they've fenced it all off, so you can't do any of it. And they've got patrol up there, and now they've built these million dollar homes, yeah. and yeah. it's called the Summit. Yeah, and it's no fun up there. Well, but you still have guys going through there, and we 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 still did a lot of that up until the seventies. You know what's racing up there? Those, those stupid TMZ buses. TMZ buses. <laughs> oh yeah, the ones that take you to like celebrity homes. Yeah, and, hey, the this celebrity is where, buses. This is where Britney really Spears got the haircut. Yeah, yeah. That's before uh-huh. they spin out, and somebody has to get a thousand dollars to yeah. tow them out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. And that's it. All right, and Stormy's behind us. Stormy, you've been sitting there awfully quiet. What was your high school car? Come on up here. Show the mic with, uh, with Anna. Uh, Hello. Well, I had a 62 VW Beetle. No, I'm good. Uh, 62 uh, Country Squire Ford Wagon. I had a 65 Ford camera. Country <laughs> Wagon. 55 Chevy Gasser. 65 Ranchero uh, Street Racer. Uh, 33 uh, Bantam guy. Altered uh, on the street with a, a Bantam Altered. Oh, yeah. I had a had a bunch. Hot diggity. So I'm back, but I'm back to bu- driving regular cars. Uh, my Yukon and uh, I still have a Chevy wagon Your and Chevy then wagon. of course my I have a '64. Now I have a '64 Sprint Falcon yeah. Gasser, jacked up, two front tube axle, dual quads to the hood. You know. <laughs> <laughs> four, four speed top loader, the whole deal. You know, tuck and roll poster, every you know the whole the whole deal. So, it just I, 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 it's a Tell disease which is no known cure. Failure to no. go to the meltdown tracks. No, oh, we're sorry. going back. We left Saturday this past Saturday to go to uh, Byron, Illinois, for the meltdown drag. So I was going to try to defend my top speed title, but uh, getting up in the uh, upper Utah, uh, we had problems with the Yukon. So rather than break down in uh, somewhere in the cornfields of Nebraska, I just decided to turn around and call it a day, and we got our back. And we'll, we'll figure it out. And we'll, if anyone can, you can. Yeah, exactly. Hey. You know. so, okay. Yeah. Better a Yukon than a Yugo. That's true. <laughs> All right. Sounds hey, like a so bad yogurt. I, not that I don't want to cut you off, certainly, but I do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just want to remind everybody. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> that, done that. <laughs> you've done that many times. This Saturday in beautiful downtown Glendale, California on Brand Boulevard, we are going to have a car show. It's called the Glendale Cruise Night. Randy and I are both going to be there. We're going to be in the KNX booth at in front of the what trailer is that? Well, it's going to be an Airstream. Airstream. The amazing KNX Airstream. And uh, we're going to be right there. One of Bob's cars is going to be there. My uh, 57 wagon is going to be there. So we're going to get a chance to come by uh, and do some things there. It'll be fun. Yeah. Get a chance to talk to some of you people who have cars out there. Maybe put some of this uh, on our respective Facebook pages. Yeah. And uh, just get a chance to say hi. Come by and say hello. Yeah. Tell us your car story. Come see us at the Glendale Car Show. I guess it opens to the public at about 4 or 5 o'clock? Yeah, about 4 or 5 o'clock or so on yeah. Saturday. Goes through till they have a fireworks show, believe it or not, as oh, if wow. you didn't have enough, enough of that. Fire, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there'll be a fireworks show there and a whole lot of things you could do. Four different bands, I believe, are playing at different sections of it. Mm-hmm. There's probably about four or five hundred cars that'll be lining this four lane street. So don't miss it. It's free to any spectator that comes out this Saturday night, Glendale Boulevard or Glendale, California, Brand Boulevard. And come on out and look for us. Look for the uh, Airstream. I'll have my Plymouth Coupe. Randy's going to have his Pontiac Safari. Come by, say hi, and uh, hey, you never know. We may talk to you about your your car story. Car story and put it on the air. 
That'd be fun. That'd be fun. And by the way, while you're at it, uh, if you're looking for sports updates, you could listen to me on KNX 1070 News Radio and KNX 10. Well, it would be KNX 1070.com. It'd be CBSLA.com, but you could listen live. I I heard you this morning, Randy. In fact, you had a, uh, there was a vintage clip that you were, it was like a 50-year-old vintage clip that you were playing when Uh, they The 1967 uh, All-Star game. That was it. Yeah. 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 Boy, those announcers back then, they were very much like that, and that's the way it was. I love the newsreel music underneath that. We used to do something like that on Channel 11 called uh, sports around the world. That was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right, I want to you... thank Randy for coming out and legitimizing our show because he's famous. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <Thank> you. <laughs> I gotta look that up and figure out what that means. Wait, <laughs> where is that? Yeah, yeah. First thrash, now this. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, I'm the great Karnak and uh, <laughs> UCLA. The show, ICLA, but with my glasses on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's another show in the in the t- in the can. Bruce, why don't you close us out for the night? How about we do this? The encore presentation of this show comes up next on most of these stations. Thanks so much for joining us. We're back in two weeks, right here. Good night, everybody.